Well, hello and welcome to this edition of COVID Conversations, in which my colleague Professor Peter Horby and myself, Professor Martin Landre, will be discussing the ongoing results from the recovery trial uh, with a particular focus on uh, some of the most exciting results uh, around dexamethasone. Thank you for joining us. The format will be around 15 minutes of uh, presentation followed by around 15 minutes of uh, discussion. And we'd like to hear your questions. Now there are three ways of submitting your questions. The first is that you can use the chat window on YouTube. The second is that you can use the comments section, section in Facebook. And the third is if you're using other social media platforms, uh, use the hashtag of COVID conversations. So we're working off for home Wi-Fi. Uh, all has gone well in rehearsals, um, but if there are any interruptions, please bear with us. So now I'll pass you over to my colleague, Professor Peter Horby, uh, to uh, tell us something about the recovery trial. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Martin. <clears throat> and thanks for the warnings about internet and dogs as well, which may be barking. Um, okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you about the, the recovery trial, which stands for Randomized Evaluation of COVID-19 Therapies. Uh, myself and Martin are the co-chief investigators, but it's, run by a very big team at Oxford and also with huge support from across the NHS and the, the National Institutes of Health Research and others. So a quick bit of background, as you know, um, COVID-19 is caused by a new virus, sars coronavirus 2 Most people um, who get infected have quite a self-limiting illness, a mild illness, or perhaps no symptoms at all. But quite a lot of patients get hospitalised. And if you are hospitalised, the mortality can be quite high. Yeah, so sorry about that. That's unfortunate, particularly as you're describing high mortality. Um, um, really uh, I hope they can join, rejoin us. So, Peter, we uh, lost you for a moment. You were talking on the previous slide about the high mortality that can uh, happen with COVID. Am I back now? You're definitely back. OK, thank you. Sorry about that. So it's causing an unprecedented clinical challenge. We're seeing very overstretched health services, huge time pressures on staff. Um, and large numbers of, of very unwell patients and obviously uh, anxious staff. The graphs at the bottom show the UK case numbers and on the right, the UK number of deaths, which as you all know, um, have been high. And there's huge uncertainty about how we treat this disease. Uh, it, it's a new disease and we're continually learning about it. There's both um, the viral replication component, but we're also seeing inflammation, we're also seeing blood clotting. And in children, we may be seeing a sort of post-infectious inflammatory syndrome. In terms of drugs, lots of treatments have been proposed, um, but none of them really had any strong data in which to base treatments. So trials are needed. There's lots of observational data, so reports of case series of patients or cohorts of patients, but really that's not strong enough to change treatment practice. So we've, in the recovery trial, taken a few principles at the start. One, we wanted to pick those drugs which looked as if they may have benefit based on laboratory or animal data, where we knew the safety profile so that we could give them to patients at scale with some confidence about the safety for those patients, and that there could be scale up of the drugs um, if any of them were proven to be useful. So the principles we've used have been based on what we know about the, the, the way that the disease evolves. What we see, and this is a, a diagram from the early days in, in January um, from China, it's really a two-phase disease. In the first seven days, patients have a mild respiratory illness, and at about a week into the illness, there's a divergence. People either start to get better or they start to deteriorate, and it's at that stage they come into hospital with increasing breathlessness that may progress to respiratory distress and then intensive care. And so what we're seeing is a viral response early on with the virus, virus replication peaking 
in the first few days of illness or even before the first day of illness. And that gradually declines. And in those patients that don't recover, we see an increasing inflammatory response. So there are two parts of the disease to focus on. Um, and on the right is a picture really of the process of the, of the virus as, as the spiky ball that's getting um, attaches to cell surface receptors and then is brought into the cell and replicates and then is released. And we can act at different points of this process. And the drugs are named there in red and the ones that we are using um, target various parts in that pathway. So inflammation, which we've talked about, corticosteroids, azithromycin and others attack the inflammatory stage. Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine are involved in when the virus comes into the cell through a process called endo endocytosis and tries to interfere with that. Lipinavir, ritonavir, the HIV drug, interferes with replication, a certain stage of replication. And you can see that the other drug that people will know, remdesivir, um, attacks a different part of the replication cycle. And then we have more targeted anti-inflammatory drugs, drugs such as tocilizumab. And so these are the drugs that we've been studying along with more recently convalescent plasma, which is plasma from recovered patients that contains antibodies that bind to the outside of the virus and stop it infecting cells. There are other potential treatment targets such as anticoagulants um, and parts of the um, receptor binding pathways, um, but we're not yet studying those in, in this trial. So what we're studying, antiviral treatments, lipinavir, ritonavir, an antiviral drug that's used for HIV, hydroxychloroquine, used to treat malaria and rheumatological conditions, but has activity against a wide range of viruses in the laboratory, convalescent plasma, and then immune system treatments, dexamethasone, which is a steroid, which dampens down the inflammatory response, azithromycin, which is an antibiotic, but also has an anti-inflammatory uh, properties to it, and tocilizumab, which is a very targeted anti-inflammatory drug that just targets a specific part of the anti-inflammatory pathway. And just to show you that these drugs are, are recommended in um, current treatments. So this is the, uh, a review of current treatments that are recommended or, or, or were recommended for um, COVID-19. And this was taken from about March. And you can see here under antivirals, we have hydroxychloroquine and lipinavir, ritonavir, recommended in many countries. Um, whereas on the right-hand side, you can see the recommendations around steroids and actually, they're not recommended generally. So contraindicated in the WHO recommendations and not recommended in most other um, clinical guidance. So really, we're looking at drugs that are currently or have been in clinical guidance documents. So the trial design, <clears throat> very simple. We've kept it simple because of those constraints on the healthcare system and the pressures on staff and patients. So. This is in hospitalized patients who have proven or suspected SARS-CoV-2 infection. And if they agree to be in the trial, then they are randomized to no additional treatment or one of four treatment arms. So lipinavir, dexamethasone, hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. And so patients will by chance be allocated to one of those five groups. And the outcome is are the patients alive or deceased at day 28 after randomization. And then some other outcomes we're looking at, duration in hospital and whether patients progress to require mechanical ventilation um, or death as a, as a combined outcome. So this is what we started with. Subsequently, we've added convalescent plasma as another randomization because that has become available as patients have recovered from the disease. And then we've also added this extra anti-inflammatory drug called tocilizumab, which if patients deteriorate, so their oxygen saturation drops and they have markers of inflammation, then they may also be randomized to tocilizumab. So the implementation of the study. So this graph on the left shows um, you know, the early stages of the outbreak. And there were two trials that were done very early on in China, which we were involved in. And here you can see that the recovery randomized control trial started quite early in the global outbreak. And on the right, you can see the UK outbreak where we managed to start um, well before the peak, um, which explains why we managed to enroll a lot of patients. Um, 
this shows you the distribution of the hospitals that are recruiting patients. And we have over 175 hospitals recruiting patients across the whole UK. Um, and the size of the green circles indicates the size of recruitment for each of those hospitals. So you can see we have many, many hospitals um, spread across the UK. And this graph shows the recruitment by days, um, where it very much matches the outbreak, where we had a peak um, about a, a month into our trial with over 400 patients per day at the peak. And it's now declined um, and we're at about 30 patients per day. And you can see there's a big drop off during the weekends um, as the research staff are obviously um, not working as much at the weekends. So we've now enrolled over 11,900 patients into the main randomization. And down here, you can see the randomization into the, into the newer components. So over 770 have got the tocilizumab and over 120 have now been randomized to convalescent plasma, which started a bit later. And just to show you, this is the age distribution of those randomized. <clears throat> so it's extremely wide. So our youngest patient is under one and our oldest patient is 102. So we cover the whole age range. But as we've seen with COVID, the more severe disease is in older patients. So the peak of disease is in older adults. So the results. Um, preponderance of males, which is typical of COVID, um, and the average age of patients is about 66, um, and about eight days from onset to randomization into the trial. We categorize patients into three um, levels of severity at randomization. Those on the hospital ward, but not requiring oxygen is about a quarter. Those on the ward requiring oxygen, about 60%, and those that are more severe and are requiring a mechanical ventilation, about 13%. And about a quarter of patients have one of a number of comorbidities, such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or chronic lung disease. And overall, about 50% um, have one or more comorbidities. And so this shows you the overall um, mortality in the trial. It's actually quite high mortality. It's, it's completely in line with what you see throughout the NHS from other studies. We have enrolled about 15% of all patients in the UK. Um, and this mortality rate of about 25% is the same across the whole of the, the NHS with, as you can see on the right, clear increase in mortality with age. There's, there's actually very low mortality in children um, and it increases markedly from the age of 50 or more. So the results, um, hydroxychloroquine, which we um, announced first, <clears throat> we had 1,561 patients who were allocated to hydroxychloroquine compared to 3,155 to usual care alone. We have this two to one ratio because we are using some of the controls, uh, the usual care patients across different arms. So we need more patients in that group. And you can see that the average age is about 65. Um, again, about 60% male. Sorry, going the wrong way. Um, and pretty much similar to the earlier results I showed with about a quarter on oxygen, um, 60%, sorry, a quarter not on oxygen, 60% on oxygen, and about 15 to 17% on ventilation. So what we saw was that hydroxychloroquine in this patient group did not improve outcomes. Um, the relative risk there shows you the, the risk of death compared to usual care, and so it's actually above one, which means that there's a slightly increased risks in the hydroxychloroquine group, but the, the p-value, so the statistical significance is, is 0.1, which means that's not a statistically significant difference. So what we can say is that hydroxychloroquine does not improve mortality when used in patients in hospital. So we stopped recruitment 76 days after we started enrollment hydroxychloroquine and announced the results on the same day. Um, that did gain a lot of interest um, because hydroxychloroquine has, has had a lot of press, as has chloroquine, and it has resulted in changes in practice. In the US, where the FDA had allowed chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine to be used in patients with COVID, they revoked that emergency use authorization based on um, our data. And that result um, was followed just after 10 days with that change in policy in the US. Moving on to dexamethasone, we had 2,104 patients um, on dexamethasone and 
about double that on usual care. Again, a similar picture in terms of the distribution by age um, and disease severity. Here, the result was very different where we clearly saw our benefits um, with dexamethasone in some subgroups of patients. If we look at the oxygen only group, you can see, which was about 4,000 patients, you can see that the relative risk is 0.8, which is a 20% reduction in the risk of death in the dexamethasone arm compared to the usual care arm and with a high level of statistical significance. So you can see the difference here, better survival on dexamethasone. This difference was even more marked in the patients on invasive mechanical ventilation, which was about a thousand patients, where there's a much bigger gap here. And so about a 35% reduction in the risk of death if the patients get dexamethasone. And again, statistically very significant difference. And this, I won't go into detail into this, but this just shows you the results broken down by age, gender, day since symptom onset, and baseline risk of mortality. And if you're on this side of the line, it indicates that dexamethasone improves the outcome. And if you're on the other side, it shows that usual care is better. And you can see that every, everything is either on the line or to the left of the line, which indicates that we don't see a benefit of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, sorry, we do see a benefit of dexamethasone in all patient subgroups. And so here's the, the overall results. Um, and what I want to point out here is in the no oxygen group, dexamethasone actually performed worse. So we did not see an, improval, uh, an improvement in survival in this subgroup. Actually, we saw an increase, although not statistically significant. So dexamethasone is not recommended for patients who don't need oxygen, but for patients who need oxygen or invasive mechanical ventilation, it clearly provides um, a benefit and improves the risk, um, and improves the chances of survival. So we stopped recruitment after 81 days. Um, we announced the results after 89 days. There was a bit of a delay there because we had to tease apart this different effect in different patient subgroups. And this is using a drug that costs five pounds for 10 days and is widely available internationally and is on the WHO list of essential medicines. So we're very pleased with this result because we have found a drug that works um, and is available to patients throughout the world. This has also received a lot of attention. Um, four hours after our announcement, the, the NHS, all four chief medical officers announced a change in treatment policy, um, which was followed afterwards by, in the US, a change in treatment policy. Um, and the WHO welcomed um, the dexamethasone results and are currently updating their guidance. And finally, the pinavir ritonavir, which we just announced on Monday. This is the anti-HIV drug, um, which um, has been used um, on Monday, again, with about uh, 1,500 patients on treatment compared to twice as many on usual care. We really saw no difference between them. And you can see from this survival curve on the left, the red line and the black line pretty much match each other, showing that there's no benefit from giving um, this drug um, and so that's why we stopped the trial because continuing recruitment would not be of any benefit to patients. So we do not recommend this drug in patients who are hospitalized. Um, and again, we've only just announced that, um, but already we are seeing some interest in that. So it's the huge team that's behind this, not just myself and Martin, these are the people doing um, all the hard work, um, but more importantly, we're supported by the entire NHS and the doctors and nurses um, and all the staff in the hospitals. Um, and so it's a big thank you from the team to all of those people that have made this possible. We have a website where all the information is available. There's information for patients with videos. There is information for site staff, which shows the number of participants we have, the number of sites and, and all the documentation that anyone would ever wanna see. Um, and also we're posting the results as they become available. Um, the acknowledgements we're, we're funded from the um, UK Research and Innovation and National Institutes for Health Research with core funding from many other groups. Um, and we couldn't have done this without the whole of the NHS and the NIHR the clinical networks um, and many, many others. But a particular thanks to the you know, thousands of doctors and nurses and other healthcare staff in over 175 hospitals and to the tens of thousands of patients who are participating in the study. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, so reminder, uh, please submit your questions and we've already had some in.
Um, but perhaps I'd take the sort of chairman's privilege and just ask you, Peter, you've done a lot of trials in uh, outbreaks and epidemics, but what do you think has been different this time around and particularly what's been different about recovery? I've had involvement in trials in, uh, in outbreaks for almost um, yeah, 15 years, and it's always extremely difficult to get them started early enough, um, usually due to the complexity of the protocols that are used um, and these slow systems for approval and um, getting documents signed and getting the systems in place. So this has been remarkably quick. As, as Martin knows, the protocol was um, written um, and just nine days later, we enrolled the first patient, which is an absolute world record. In fact, for, for the China trial, we, we started enrollment 21 days after the protocol was written. And I, I remember standing up in a talk and saying, I'm going to retire now, we'll never beat that. And then we managed nine days, which is remarkable. And the second thing is the scale. It's across you know, 175 hospitals. Previously, we, we've worked in a very small number of sites. So to do it at this scale is remarkable. And it's really taking lessons from the huge trials in cardiovascular medicine that Martin's been in, involved in and applying them to, to an emergency situation that's really made all the difference. Good. So just turning to some of the, uh, uh, the audience questions, I mean, the first comes from Brian on YouTube. This first breakthrough with dexamethasone, has that, do you think, helped speed up the possibility of future breakthroughs? It's demonstrated that there is possibility of treatments that have a substantial effect. We were all shocked by the fact that we could get a 30% reduction in the death rate in mechanically ventilated patients. That's almost unheard of in intensive care. Um, it's really is remarkable. And it shows that the inflammation is obviously playing a big role in the more severe cases and that by tackling that part of the disease process, we can make a big difference. And so I think it's given us all a lot of optimism that by building on that foundation of adding perhaps other anti-inflammatories, trying to find a good antiviral, and then with other interventions like drugs and aimed at the um, coagulation problems, we might actually really managed to make a big difference in, in the rate of deaths in COVID. And I, I guess that sort of builds on something that Miranda has asked us on YouTube. I mean, these particular drugs that we've chosen, why these ones? I mean, there are hundreds of, of drugs that, that we could have chosen. Uh, why, why these ones? And, and do you think, again, that there's some lessons for others there? It was a combination of drugs that there was some biological reason to think they would work. Um, not just theoretical, but also um, laboratory-based studies looking at um, antiviral um, inhibition or viral inhibition or um, anti-inflammatory properties or studies that have shown that perhaps in animal models, it reduces the rate of viral replication or improves survival, etc. So they all had some good rationale for use and they were all immediately available for use in a big enough trial to see an effect on mortality. So that's what really led us to choose these drugs. Okay, and, and I mean, I, th I think one question that's in people's mind is around access. It's all very well, first of all, having a drug that people think might work and the trials, a good way of differentiating those from that we think might work from those that we know do work. But if the treatment can't be got to the patient, um, then it's still not a, 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 a sustainable uh, way of tackling this disease. So have you thoughts about this? And, and in particular, um, uh, Jesus on Facebook you know, asked, why in the US a focus on remdesivir when there's dexamethasone widely available? So I suppose that's two questions in one. Yeah, I mean, you know, a drug is not a treatment until it's, it's, it's in a patient. Um, so, you know, access is, is absolutely essential. There's no point in having a drug that's, that's sat um, in a cupboard somewhere if you can't give it to a patient. So that's part of the reason we chose these drugs and part of the reason we were so pleased that dexamethasone was shown to be effective because that really is available. I think you need to test the experimental drugs as well as the, the repurposed drugs, the drugs that are already available for other diseases, because particularly for the antivirals, we don't really have any good antiviral um, drugs to test at the moment. And there'll probably need to be drugs that are designed for COVID specifically that will be beneficial. And although in the early stages, the availability of those drugs might be limited um, with a scale up of manufacturing and diversification of the manufacturing process to other countries, then they should become available in the future. So I think you need to be using dexamethasone now and then adding remdesivir when it becomes available. And I mean, I guess related to that, uh, the, 
I remember at the beginning, back probably back February, the World Health Organization, the European Medicines Agency, and a number of others were drawing the comparison with previous epidemics where there had been multiple trials, uh, all quite small, or indeed no trials at all, as I think we saw in uh, Italy, particularly during the uh, early part of this year. So what do you think is, is the lessons we've got from recovery uh, with regards to how to decide on which trials to do and what they should look like? When there's a new epidemic, there's always a massive um, clinical demand from the patients and, and the doctors and a massive temptation to just use anything where there's any suggestion it might work and, and give it to your patients to save them. Um, you know, what we saw in the past, particularly in the 2009 flu pandemic and, and in, in many other outbreaks, is that it doesn't advance pace. Care, gal, use of medicines <clears throat> without any proven um, efficacy, particularly, for instance, um, convalescent plasma has been used on a very large scale in the US, but outside of trials. So despite tens of thousands of patients getting that drug um, or getting that treatment, we don't know if it works, which is a massive missed opportunity. So we have to build clinical trials into the clinical care so that you do have access to medicines for your patients, but within the context of a trial so that we all learn what works and what doesn't and actually we make progress in improving people's care. And uh, I, do you think that we can expand the trial? I mean, could, could recovery be taken overseas or, or could at least the model of recovery be taken overseas? I think certainly the model can. Martin, you know, you'll know very well from your, your experiences that the cardi big cardiovascular trials are often multi-country um, mm. and they're often big, simple trials with very clear outcomes like mortality. And so I think we really do need to export this model in some sense, in some way. Yes, and, and I guess for my area in, in cardiovascular disease, I mean, this is a little bit like going uh, back to the 1980s when we had no treatments for acute heart attack. Um, and in fact, actually, I had that protocol open um, when we were writing this one was thinking about uh, keeping it really simple, but keeping it really focused on what's most important. Um, easy to make things complicated. It's actually quite hard to make things simple, but to really, really get the answers. I think we've seen uh, dividends from that. Mm -hmm. um, a question's just come in about the NHS and the NHS's role. Um, so I'll ask you two questions. The first I'll say is, you know, just how has the NHS helped? And, and uh, I mean, this has certainly been a whole country trial. We, you and I, I know, don't feel it is our trial. It's everybody's trial. But perhaps you could give a little bit of comment on, on the role of the NHS. Yeah, I think you, you should add into that, Martin, because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a tropical doctor. So, you know, running trials in the UK is new to me. Um, but it's clear that the, the NHS uh, has been absolutely fundamental to get the trial open in 175 hospitals so quickly is just an incredible achievement, one of which I think many countries are quite envious. And it's not just yeah. the NHS, it's also the, the, the health research infrastructure that's, that's been put in place in parallel to the NHS. Yeah, I mean, I think to add to that, I'd say that the, I mean, the NHS has been a magnificent, but so too clearly the patients and the public. Um, these are patients who are extraordinarily anxious they're alone because of social distancing and infection control measures, and often elderly, um, and their contribution has been and support has been amazing. But I think one of the things it highlights is the benefits of long-term investment. So long-term investment in um, the research culture within the UK, and particularly in within uh, the search networks uh, through the National Institute for Health Research. And finally, I'd say that one of the big assets has been the access to data. So not only can we study uh, what happens to these patients during the first month of their hospital admission, but in the first six months, uh, perhaps after they go home and beyond that, to look for later complications and the impact of the treatments on later complications. One thing I would say, though, is that if one's turning to an international audience, is that you don't, it's fantastic having the NHS, it makes a huge difference. But don't use the lack of an NHS as the excuse for not doing these sorts of trials. It would be perfectly possible to take the recovery uh, design uh, philosophy mentality, if you like, and place it in a large healthcare provider in the United States uh, or in Singapore or in Brazil or anywhere, anywhere else. It's not like this is a rare disease. It's the, it's the philosophy and the design, the simplicity of the design and the focus on the questions could be anywhere. 
having the NHS has made that a whole load easier, but I think still there are lessons that are, that are international. Mm. So um, I think we're coming towards the end of the, of the questions and probably the, towards the end of the time. Um, what does the future hold, Peter? What does the future hold for recovery and what does the future hold for treatments for, for COVID? Let me start with the second part of that question. For treatments, I'm optimistic that we will find additional beneficial treatments and that when we put them together in combination, um, we'll make, make a big difference. I think it's also important to not forget trials outside the hospital to give treatments to people who are at risk with mild disease to stop them getting into hospital and also preventative trials, so prophylaxis trials. So hopefully some of those will prove successful as well. In terms of what it means for the future. I hope this really, um, in a way, is a, is a watershed in how clinical trials are done. We've made this extremely simple, extremely pragmatic, um, and, and extremely scalable. And we've shown that you can get answers very quickly and safely. Um, but to do that, you need to have the right mentality and you need to have the systems in place that facilitate these types of trials to happen. And I think we can learn a lot of lessons from this trial for many other areas of um, of research in, in, in medical conditions. Fantastic. So I think we'll, as I say, draw to a close. I, I just want to say that you know, clearly this is the sort of work that requires a huge number of researchers. And indeed, the related activities on COVID uh, uh, being uh, uh, conducted in uh, the University of Oxford uh, require hu uh, huge support. So um, if you are um, uh, keen to uh, help us, there is a link to uh, the how to support us uh, at the bottom of the uh, video um, and um, uh, any donations, big or small, of course, would be welcome. Uh, but uh, you'll also find there information about next week's talk. Um, uh, but finally, I, I wanted to say a few thanks. Thanks to Peter clearly for presenting. Uh, thanks to you for listening. But, fi but very finally, thank you to the huge number of doctors, nurses, researchers, and particularly patients across the UK who have made uh, a world-leading difference to how we tackle this pandemic. Thank you all very much. Thank you for watching.